It's Song Talk Radio. Welcome to Song Talk Radio, the show with songwriters talking to other songwriters about the craft of songwriting. We share tips, tools, and techniques, and together we all become better at writing songs. I'm your host, Neil Modi, and with me, my co-host, Phil Emery. How you doing, Phil? I am I am a wash in cats at the moment. I have three cats who decided washing, to join me for the show. So you're a it's, washing cats or you're washing cats? <laughs> I'm a washing cats. I don't think I'd wash oh, them yet. But, <laughs> so there may be some weird stuff happening. Oh, but. they're they're good at licking themselves. They're fine. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, meantime, please send your comments, your questions, your cat cleaning recipes to um, at Song Talk Radio on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, or feedback at songtalk.ca for the good old-fashioned email, and we'll share your thoughts on the show. And please visit songtalk.ca to see the show post for this episode, to find links to resources we mentioned, and to download lyric and chord sheets to follow along with the songs that we feature. So tonight, um, before we get to our guest, uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Uh, once again, uh, we have officially launched our songwriting challenge for 2023, which is to write a song in a mode. Mm -hmm. um, or a mode that you're not uh, familiar with or that you're that's unusual for you just to um, to get you writing outside of your normal boxes. And uh, we have a uh, resource page uh, that's continually growing um, on uh, songtalk.ca. You'll notice in the sidebar, uh, there's a Songwriting Challenge 2023 uh, web page there. We posted a couple of videos, a um, couple of uh, resources and things. Um, and uh, one of the resources we just posted there uh, a little while ago was something that um, one of our friends from the meetup and, and from this podcast uh, uh, sent us, Lin Mo, uh, sent us uh, a link to uh, hooktheory.com, who, you know, hooktheory.com, if you don't know about it, is a great resource just Indeed. for songwriters in general. It's got a, they got a ton of great content on there. I haven't been on there in quite a while, but what I didn't realize until Lin sent us this is that they have a what they call key cheat sheets. It's a bit of a tongue twister, but key cheat sheets, cheat sheets. <laughs> key cheat sheets, and and they have you know cheat sheets like sample chord progressions and stuff for every key for every mode, mm -hmm. um, and and it's a pretty handy little little thing if you're if you're feeling a little bit stuck or you need a little bit of um, a little push a little uh, inspiration just to get your head around it and stuff. Um, yeah, working with modes can be a little weird at first. Mm -hmm. um, one tip I figured out is if you're playing with the melody instead of just playing the chords and trying to come up with the melody is uh, there's certain intervals in every mode that is distinctive to that mode. Mm -hmm. So if you play, you know, choose whatever route you want in uh, that you're going to work in, but then play around with like a, like a fifth and then the one or two distinctive intervals and you know sort of play them over and over again and get them into your brain because it'll sound kind of weird at first but that's how you can sort of bring that mode sense into the uh in, in, into your song i yeah. think that seemed to, to to help me a lot yeah that, that's a really good tip is if you want to if you if you, if you are a songwriter that's used to leading by melody then yeah work at the intervals because like for example if you're in lydian it's it's like a major scale but with a sharp four so if you go from your root note of the scale yeah. to a sharp four if you go from a c to an f sharp that's it a, sounds that, weird yeah it sounds weird but that is a sort of move that will definitely put your song into lydian yeah <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's no doubt about it as soon as you make that move you know i think the i think the first three notes of the simpsons is like a, a tritone or something like that oh and yeah it's very distinctly in a i don't even know a mode it's in that's i mean you will thing, be as a songwriter, you will be uncomfortable in this. Like, the idea is not to just try something easy. It is The idea is to challenge yourself, um, to push yourself in places where you haven't been. So it's going to be a little bit... A little bit uncomfortable at first, but I think if you push through, you'll wind up learning a lot. You may not wind up with the best song you've ever written, but that's mm -hmm. okay. I think you'll learn something. And maybe you'll have, oh, oh, maybe the end of the chorus is really cool, and you can take that and, and make that into something. But it's mostly about learning how to use modes, which is something I don't think, well, I think I've done, but I haven't consciously done it. So that's going to be a bit of a change for me. 
Yeah, yeah, me too. I've done it by accident many, many, many times. Maybe even kind yeah. of on purpose, but not really, not really thinking about where it was landing exactly. Yeah. Just kind of, I think, I think this is a mode. Okay, <laughs> sounds <laughs> weird. I don't know. Sounds weird. Sounds <laughs> a little different. Um, but um, yeah, I was going to say yeah because the the other thing with these challenges too is you can you can ultimately think of them as a springboard. Mm. And once you finish the challenge and and share your songs with us, because like we did last year, we had, you know, several episodes where we shared our listeners answers to the challenge, which was which was great fun and and really yeah. and really um, reviewing as to you know how many different answers you can get to the same question. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, but, but you can you can you can treat that as a springboard. I did that with the first year we did the challenge. I, I did a song and I met the parameters of the challenge but then i knew i had another version of the song in my pocket that no longer met the challenge the challenge requirements but still resulted in the song that i mm. wanted to write so right right you know so you, you can certainly do that give give us your challenge answer and then revisit it afterwards and take it outside the challenge and, and then yeah. it becomes another song you know very much and uh, with, with respect to that um when we did our episode um with jeff allen greenway uh, a couple weeks ago um, where we dove in deep on on two modes um, uh, uh, on uh, Dorian and Dorian and Lydian, right? So, mm. <laughs> I think it was. Yeah. And um, and 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 Jeff had used the example of uh, Mad World by by Tears for Fears, um, and uh, and and the way that Jeff had explained it was that it was it was very clearly Dorian in the verses, and and then Aeolian or natural minor mm. in the chorus. Um, but every every like ultimateguitar.com or every sort of you know chord sheet that I looked up on the internet, and m more importantly, when I played along to it on on my keyboard, uh, along to the Tears for Fears recording, I found that it was actually um, uh, Dorian all the way through because mm. uh, uh, the way the way Jeff was explaining it was that the last chord in the in the uh, in the in the chord progression. Uh, put it in. Well, actually, sorry. The 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 verse chord progression was was um, minor. F sharp. Yeah, it was like F sharp. Uh, what was a B F sharp B A. Uh, what was that? And then a B minor. It was a B minor yeah. on the end, at the end of that progression. But when you play along with with the series for free recording, it's actually a B major. Major. Chord. Yeah. So which which does put it in in Dorian, and and it's because of that what you were talking about before that that different interval that the b major chord gives you as opposed to the b minor um and and then and then stays in dorian for the uh for for the the chorus however even even but jeff is kind of right because he was playing it on his piano and singing along to it so he's essentially doing a cover version hmm. and and when you do a cover version you can reharmonize a song Right? That's you can true. play, you can play, you can do chord substitutions. That's essentially what he did. He flipped that B major into a B minor, sang the same melody, and it's and, and it's the kind of melody that works with either yes. of those chords underneath it. So it was fine and it yeah. sounded right. It's only if you play along with the original recording, of yeah. recording that it sounds wrong. <laughs> Especially <laughs> if you, you play it on the guitar, because I found out from reading an art interview with him. Um, many many years ago is that that al first album was pretty well all written on guitar hmm. so it has a very kind of guitar approach especially like a young guitarist approach where te everything tends to be major because it's you know what you uh what you mm. know how to how to play and okay. um so when you play it with a guitar when you try hitting that b minor before the chorus it sounds out of tune like it mm -hmm. sounds like it's out of key it's like oh this, that's not right yeah so yeah. i think it's you know but with you know in isolation it could go either way but um it's mm -hmm. like there's that version of um mad world that's done the, the by the piano. Version. yeah which is very yeah. different um, and he totally yeah. reimagined it, which I think, you know, if you're going to do a cover song, you tr should try to reimagine it because it's hard to yeah. do it as well as the original people did it. Yeah, and then and then there's always that there's always that oranges to oranges comparison. Well, they didn't do it quite as well as they did, or whatever. And then that's always good to yeah reimagine it. Those are the cover songs I like anyway. Yeah, me too. Well, my favorite cool. cover song of all time is uh, Devo's version of Satisfaction. So. Oh really? I don't think I've heard that. One of my one of my favorites is uh, Tori Amos doing um, "Smells Like Teen Spirit." Oh, teen Spirit, yeah, yeah, that's such a great. good cover. Yeah. <laughs> totally reimagined as a as a Tori Amos thing, but uh, if we wouldn't have so much trouble with with YouTube, maybe we could do like a 
a listener channel uh, challenge where they re- reimagine like cover songs. Oh yeah, yeah. Like trying try to and the idea is to drastically change it. So oh yeah, that's a, that's a good know. that's a good challenge actually. Yeah, maybe we will do that. We never get it through YouTube, but maybe I just yeah. Ask. So we don't post that one episode on YouTube, whatever. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I think cover songs are okay on YouTube. You just can't copyright the whole thing. No, that's true. Um, yeah. Okay, and um, just a shout out to um, a couple of weeks ago, the, uh, the Junos were on, and uh, one of our former guests, Kirk Diamond, uh, a reggae bass artist uh, from uh, Brampton, Ontario, um, uh, uh, one along with his collaborators, Car. Uh, Cairo McLean and Finn, um, featuring Cairo McLean, uh, for uh, Reggae Recording of the Year for their song Reggae Party. So congratulations to Kirk Diamond. That is awesome. Great to see him uh, pick up Juno a couple of weeks ago. So awesome stuff. And uh, yeah, that's about it for our for our pre-show stuff. Um, tonight, uh, we're here very happy to welcome indie folk Americana band uh, Calico. And here's a taste of their song, Lay Me Down. and fears Taken by the night Mind and stone Broke down the throne Give me light To rise up despite right Calico, an independent folk Americana band based in British Columbia, formed at the start of the pandemic by creatively negotiating the space between personal discovery and cooperative writing. Taking inspiration from the likes of Bob Dylan, The War on Drugs, and Nathaniel Ratcliffe, Recliff, Recliff, <laughs> the band, I'm not familiar with that artist. Somebody. The band stretched their creative process to the brink by writing their new music within the confines of their own separate homes during the isolation of the pandemic. Calico highlights the swath of Vista's unique transitions and techniques that showcase the band's take on blending musical genres. On the show, we have uh, Tony Cicchetti uh, joining us tonight. Welcome to Song Talk Radio, Tony. Hey, Neil and Phil. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Great to have you on the show, Tony. And uh, just to uh, say to our listeners, um, uh, maybe you can just uh, say what your role is in the band and uh, who the other band members are and what they do. Yeah, definitely. So I um, am the rhythm guitarist and lead vocalist for the group. Uh, We have Chris Kudo, who is the drummer and um, the co-founder, along with myself. Will Lloyd, who plays uh, lead guitar, and then jean C. Leduget, who plays uh, bass. So I said that name for you, Neil, so you didn't have to... You Thank you very much for that. I <laughs> appreciate that. And, um, and you guys all share songwriting, songwriting credits, or is it... Fall into no, me? so I wrote most of these songs, because we we started off as a pandemic band, I actually wrote a lot of the songs just as guitar and, and kind of basic vocals over the last 10 years. Um, and I mean, my, my relationship with songwriting is interesting because I, I didn't actually play guitar until I was, I'm 31 now and I didn't really play till I was 24, 25 years old. Um, grew up playing percussion and so had that kind of feel for rhythm, but, uh, was always a poet. So I wrote lyrics, but didn't have a medium to, to really convey and, and express that. And so. I was encouraged, uh, you know, six or seven years ago to pick up a guitar and started with very basic chords. Like, Phil, you were saying in, in your opening here, like when you're a new guitarist, you just play those major shapes, you know, yeah. it's like what you do. The simple, simple chord progressions. And and so we have three albums now, Calico does, and, and um, the majority of the songs, 90% of them I wrote, and then we collectively kind of, as a group, would get together and and talk about the direction we wanted to go in. And each member of the group during the pandemic would kind of, um, we would send stems of our songs and each artist would put in their own kind of creative touch. Um, Mm. So it was a really interesting, you know, way to create, especially during the pandemic, because you could still 
you know, because of the, you know, the way our work world works nowadays, and you can send stuff via, you know, email or, you know, Google drive and whatever it is. And you re- you can record that way. Um, I would send my stems as the rhythm guitarist and the vocalist, and then send them over to our drummer who would add drums and then to the bassist who would add bass. And then finally to the lead guitarist who would add kind of, you know, that those final, you know, swath of canvases as, you know, as, as you just read out, Neil, um, so what you hear, that song you opened with and the album of Midnight Moon that we just released, um, in addition to our first album, uh, Under Sudden Sun, those are all albums that were collectively created, but almost in our own way, in our own houses, at our own times, um, during the you know moments of the day that we all worked best. Um, people would kind of record their own separate parts and then we'd bring them forward to our producer and, and work together to produce. So just to get into that process a little bit more. So, so the songs were kind of written by you and then those guys would add their parts to them. So it's a, more of an arrangement thing. Like there wasn't, yeah. you guys never got together on Zoom and talked about lyrics or talked about, you know, chord choices or anything like that. Like no. or played guitars <laughs> online together. <laughs> not really. I mean, not as much as we should have. The songs, for the mo- you know, for the most part were written. And, and my structure, my songwriting, is, is quite straightforward. I mean, I, I, I was always kind of more of a lyrically lyric first kind of songwriter. Um, my familiarity and, and comfort with guitar is still growing, but came much later. Um, so I would write, you know, these very kind of straightforward, simple structures and then send them off to the guys who, um, you know, the three other instrument guys in, in Calico and they would add these, these kind of wonderful feels and textures to the, to the songs that, that were already written. So they would add to the arrangements. Did you have to re, um, re-record them in the studio or were you able to use that stuff actually in the re- released uh, material? Yeah, we were we were able to use all the stuff that we recorded from our homes in the release wow. material. So the album that you guys, I think you guys, I don't know what are the songs of Midnight Moon you, you might have uh, um, kind of listened to, but those are all songs that that were recorded in the way that we're talking about. So we didn't actually get together in studio until the third album that we recorded, which we're going to release later on this year. Um, and that album has a very different feel because it's, we're in the same room and we're, you can, it, it feels were you guys, different. Were you guys a band before, so you guys are a pandemic band. So you met during the pandemic or did you guys know each other before? Just never jammed together? Is that? We were all friends and we, we jammed together over the years, but never had the time to collectively have the time set aside just because the other guys in the group play in multiple different bands. And, and during the pandemic, when the pandemic started, all of those projects kind of came to a halt and they're touring musicians, so they couldn't tour. Um, so it kind of opened up this, this period of time for us to create a project that we'd always kind of dreamed of doing, but never had the, the opportunity to do. So it was kind of like the silver lining, at least for us, um, being able to kind of collectively create during this like weird chaotic time of the pandemic. Are you still um, a lyrics first uh, songwriter? That's a good question. I, not necessarily. I, I, I've done a bunch of songwriting workshops over the years and, and kind of write both ways now. I'd say like sometimes it's the chord progression that comes first Um you know, it's the finger picking pattern that maybe I'm, I'm like dreaming up and then it comes and then I'll put lyrics to that. Or, um, sometimes it's, it's the lyrics first, but I'd say more so nowadays it's the guitar that I write first and then I add lyrics to it, which is a switch for me because they used to be lyrics first. And when, when you write a guitar part first, do you have an idea, like a, a conceptual idea, what the lyrical content is going to be about, like what the song is about essentially? Yeah, the, the so the workshops that I used to do were run by a friend of mine in Vancouver, and he would give us a uh, kind of like an it was a songwriting challenge. We'd write a song a week, and he would give us a prompt. Um, and each week you'd be given a prompt, and then you had a week to kind of you know write your song, record it roughly, and then bring it to the to the group and share it. And so that was kind of my inspiration. And outside of the workshops, you know, as I started songwriting you know, separate of being engaged in songwriting workshops, that's kind of how I, I would write, you know, there would be a, an idea or a thought, or I'd ask, you know, some friends to kind of give me a prompt, whatever it was. I mean, some songs I've written about conversations I've had 
with my parents. So I would go and have a really conscious conversation about my mother as an activist in the seventies in San Francisco. And then I'd write a song about what that was like, what the experience of the conversation was and, and what she's telling me about, you know, some, some songs are about art pieces, you know, pick an art piece that you're really driven by and then, you know, write a poem about that art piece and how does it make you feel? And, and so that, a lot of the songs I've written are so they're, they're very emotion driven. I'm I'm a pretty emotion driven type of person. So the the emotion is almost comes out through word, which is why I used to write lyrics first, is it would just come out as poetry, and then I would kind of put guitar to it. But um, you know, as you guys both know, songwriting is comes in so many shapes and sizes and forms, and you know, we all do it how we do it. Um, what, what, what to you is the difference between writing poetry and, and writing lyric? Like what, what, what shifted in your brain for, for you to write lyrics as opposed to poetry or is there a difference? That's a great question. Um, I think, I mean, the only difference for me was that at the time I didn't have instrumentation to add to my poetry. So I think, I mean, for most folks, poetry and songwriting might be seen as one and the same. You know, they, they, they have a lot in common. And um, I think because of the style of our music specifically, because it has that kind of folk Americana vibe. I mean, my inspiration is Bob Dylan. Like I, I, he's one of my favorite artists of all time, probably my favorite. And when you look at him, you know, he, he, his songs are stories. I mean, they, they're poems, but they're stories. And I think, you know, if I try to re recreate any inspiration, it's probably him. And so that, you know, that poetry driven first thing. I think that's why I say they're, they're poems first is because he's, he's such an inspiration to me. And when I look at his music, I know so many people that don't like his voice. They like his, they like his lyrics. And, you know, when you, you know, win the Nobel prize for literature as a songwriter, I mean, I think that that shows that for whatever, you know, I know there's a lot of mixed feelings about, about him winning that, but <laughs> it just, it just shows, you know, that, um, that poetry still has a place, I think, in music nowadays, because you don't always find, I think with songwriting and songwriters nowadays, you, you don't always find that. I mean, I, I think sometimes you, you find those songwriters out there that are really consciously trying to, you know, convey their emotion through poetry. And then I think you find a lot of songwriters, depending on genre, that are kind of just putting something out there and, um, you know, might not have that same emotional connection with the words in their songs, if that makes sense. Mm. I was like trying to get at like from a from a from a craft point of view or or like a cadence kind of the way the way words fall in a lyric. Like I don't know for 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 myself, my I mean my, my lyric writing is very highly structured, and sometimes I have mm. a hard time trying to force myself to be a little bit more looser. But if if I were to, I'm not a poet by any stretch, but if I were to write a poem, I would probably be a lot looser with structure because I know I don't have to tie a melodic structure to it. Mm. And so I, I can kind of let lines be longer or lines be shorter okay. or the or the emphasis fall in different places or do something a little more a little more freeform um, with it. Um, did you not find that at all? Or did, did you or totally. maybe, maybe your poems were kind of kind of lyrical in that sense already? I they were lyrical, but I like completely resonate with what you're saying. Cause I mean, for me, I, when I wasn't playing guitar, my lines would be much longer. There was this freedom to the poetry cause I didn't, there wasn't an additional complementary aspect to it. You know, guitar, writing songs, guitar and lyrics, they're their own thing. I mean, they work so well together, but when I started playing guitar, it restricted my ability to freely write the poetry. My lines were shorter. You know, I, I would work on holding words longer so that it would fill up, you know, space a little mm. bit more. But I didn't I didn't have that same freedom. And I noticed that even when we play and we perform, sometimes we have songs where I just sing. Mm. And then the majority of the songs I, I play guitar, the songs I'm just singing, I have I'm much freer. Mm. I have a I, I don't have to worry about, you know, making sure that I'm on time and that I'm getting my, my patterns down and you know, that I'm not messing up my, my finger picking. And, um, so there's a freedom to the poetry that I think, um, that I think is, you know, and that's, that's for me, the beauty of poetry, but 
it's different. It, it was different for me for sure when I when I added in the guitar element. Because do you do you, you kind of like that? You kind of like resent that a little bit. Like you <laughs> you you wish you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to restrict your poetry because you got to nail down the guitar part. <laughs> Some sometimes a little bit. I think like I mean I needed. I always wanted to be a musician. Always wanted to be a storyteller. You know through that that medium of songwriting and. I needed the guitar to help me get to this point. So, you know, resentment, and it's a funny, it makes me laugh because it's not, not really. I mean, I, I love playing the guitar and it's such a wonderful instrument, but it, I needed it in order to, to, you know, show other musicians and, you know, kind of get this buy-in from my musical community of like, oh, hey, you write songs and these are what these songs sound like. You know, it's not just a bunch of lyrics and, and you know, you're, free verse in or you're, you know, singing a cappella. Um, and that's kind of that turned into the evolution of Calico, which, you know, like I said, we have three full length albums now and we're um just starting to get into the like performing live thing because we came out of the pandemic and, you know, we're only what I mean we're still there's it's still going on technically, but we're not really that far out of it. So we haven't even played that much live. Right. So you know, but we got three albums. So it's this yeah. bizarre kind of thing. <laughs> That's cool. It's, it's very bizarre. You have, you have lots of material to go off of. Lots of material, let's, for sure. Let's talk about um, Lay Me Down. What was the process of this song? Lay Me Down, I wrote that song about the night that my wife gave birth to our first child. Mm. And um, it was funny. We played a show a couple of weeks ago, and I, and I slipped on my words and and saying how I wrote it about the moment that she gave birth. And then I was like, well, wait a second, actually. It wasn't the exact moment. It was just the <laughs> feeling of the night okay. and just kind of the power and the, you know, the the beauty and the the feel and the emotion. Um, so, I mean, structure-wise, a lot of my songs, I use the same shapes and just work up and down the fretboard using a capo. So, um, in terms of the structure, not too different than some of the other songs. For instance, uh, Take Me With You, which is another song on, on the record, is very similar in, in in how I'm playing it. I'm just, I'm actually just like moving up and down the, the fretboard um, and just using my good old capo, which obviously transforms, you know, oh, yeah. so much, so much of the sound. Um, but the song was written about that night because it was the middle of summer, you know, during a, it wasn't quite the heat wave of BC, which, which was was very profound but it was just a hot summer and then all of a sudden for some reason that night it just started pouring rain and so my wife gave birth and started pouring rain and the next morning it was sunny again and um so the song was just kind of about the experience of you know the natural world and and the relationships that we have with the natural world and and the force and the power behind you know women and child rearing and and childbirth and and kind of observing that as a as the partner of a of someone going through that process. So I chose to share that song tonight because I was with you guys because I was like, oh, I was thinking about my kid the other day. So I was like, cool. might as well share this song. <laughs> <Why not? laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting because it, as as our as our audience knows, you can you can see the lyric sheet on songtalk.ca on the show post um, for this episode. You can follow along. And it's interesting, like, and to just to, to read the lyric and to listen to the song like we listened to earlier um, and before the show, even, you know, I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have associated that story with it because there's a lot of image image driven lyric and and it's it's a little bit a little more opaque than than a, a simple story like that. Is, is that is that a typical approach for you or because you were talking a little while ago about about, you know, Bob Dylan and very story songs, but even even. I don't know. I'm not super immersed in Bob Dylan, but a lot of his stuff is kind of poetic as well. It's not literal necessarily, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, I I am much more metaphorical than I am literal. I think in my songwriting, mm. um, you know, which is also cool because then you know the song itself is open to the interpretation of the of the listener. Yes. Um, but I think in a way I want that to be the case. You know, I don't. I tried before to write a very literal song and it never came out. I just couldn't do it for, for whatever reason. Um, you know, I, I was trying to write something about a very literal process or experience I had, and I just, it doesn't come. And I think as a songwriter, I, I think and work in that more metaphorical way of, you know, paint a picture and then leave it up to the listener or whoever is there to kind of interpret it um, as they may. 
you know, and, and sometimes I, I mean, I'm sure you, I don't know if you two feel this way with songs you've written, but like over the years you write a song and then that song kind of grows with you Mm -hmm. over the years, you listen to it and it kind of takes on a new meaning. Mm -hmm. You wrote it about something and a lot of the songs I've written, they're, they're about something. And then as I get older, I'm like, Oh, this, this has a completely different meaning to me now. Yeah, um, or, or you're, you, you, you begin to access the way your your audience might see it and interpret it totally. in a different way, right? Which totally. is yeah, which is which is certainly is certainly kind of cool. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's uh, that, that, yeah. I mean that that's that's perfectly good approach. I, mean, I, I guess you guys, I mean, you haven't performed that much, but like you you go in front of an audience and say this song is about the the night my wife gave birth yeah, to our first child, you know, and then yeah, and, and then I, sing this. <laughs> I I think like that's something. You know, because there's songwriting and then there's performing, you know, and yes. they're these own completely different art forms. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, and as I kind of start to embark on that performative side of things, it's like, how much do you share? You know, what do you share? You story tell a little bit, but, you know, do you not? You know, like, obviously, there's, you know, you kind of dissect parts of a live set and, you know, you you say, hey, I'm going to talk here. Or I'm going to talk there. But um, there's definitely songs that that I like to introduce just because I think it allows the person listening to kind of like get into the feeling of the song a bit more, um, which I think is important. I mean, I, when I introduced Lay Me Down to the last show we played, I had a friend come up after because we, we played just in front of a bunch of friends of Victoria here and they were like, no, I had no idea that that, that was about that night. I listened to that song 20 mm-hmm. times, but had yeah. no idea. Yeah. Um, and- that was on purpose. <laughs> and that was on purpose, exactly. <laughs> Intentional. Yeah, totally. Intentional. Well, why don't we uh, take a listen and then we'll talk a bit more.
Very cool. A very tight. Uh... Very nice. Very gentle. <clears throat> yes, it was a gentle, gentle feel to it. Could you hear? There's one line: "You birth to joy." That's right. So I think yeah. it's like, I think that's really the only line in there that that you know is maybe directly related to that night. Yeah. The, the experience. But, but, but again, in, in the context of the rest of the song, like I took that to be a metaphor for something. Mm. You know, you, you birth joy. It wasn't this, it wasn't literal birth to me. It was it was you birth joy like you gave. Yeah. <laughs> Totally. I mean, it's funny because like sometimes there are times where I write lyrics and I and I don't know what they mean, mm. <laughs> you know, which I, I know that other songwriters experience that as well, especially if it's a meta metaphorical thing. But it's like, you know, you put words together and they sound good, you know, and maybe that meaning comes over time. Like I was saying earlier in the moment, you're like, I actually don't know exactly what I mean right now. Uh, mm. You know, like who knows, like. You know, time can't lay me down with a whispered sound. It's like I don't know. That's the 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 chorus of that song. And still, sometimes I'm like, you know, what am I talking about there? Is it is it like, you know, am I talking to my my wife? Am I like, you know, saying to her, you know, the, that that strength is immeasurable. Like the power is that you know, like who knows? I don't know. It's just the mm -hmm. feeling that came out, you know. <laughs> and yeah. the feeling happened to be those words. <laughs> do you do much editing of your um, lyrics after you sort of written the songs, or are they kind of sort of done? No, that's that's a very interesting question because I've never never really edited songs. Um, uh -huh. Most of the time, I mean, in, in terms of the instrumentation, now now we we do that a little bit as we kind of look into the arrangements of the songs. Now that we're writing you know, as we continue to write songs, but lyrically, usually they're, they're kind of, they're written. And then as of now, we haven't done much of any editing on it, mm. which is interesting. They kind of just, they're written. And then it's just like, there they are, these like moments of time. And then it's like, hey, <sighs> don't, don't play around with it too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, do, you, do, you, do you ever go back over an older song or hear an older song and then, and then think to yourself, oh, I would have, I, today I wouldn't have written it like that. I would have said it something slightly different. Oh, totally. And, and like, you know, we play the songs, you know, cause some of these songs were, were written and recorded three years ago now and how we play them live. We play them differently live. Uh, you're changing your lyrics live. Um, sometimes add like a couple lines to a couple okay. of the songs from the first album, um, you know, or stretch out sections, which is quite normal, obviously, but like there are definitely times when, you know, when I think about, Hey, it'd be nice to like re-record the first album one day, mm. you know, do that in studio and, um, get everyone together and, and, you know, have that experience of, of kind of just being in the same space. Cause it's quite, you know, it's obviously so different when you're in the same space, mm -hmm. you know, when you're writing from afar is a pretty bizarre experience because you're not getting that kind of artistic collaborative feel. Um, and it's more fun too, when everyone's in the same room, you know. And it's more and it's more fun, exactly. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, do sure. you guys write together? Oh, go for it. Sorry. Um, yeah, I really like. There's um, a nice sort of little musical break between the two sections. It's a very short song. It's only uh, mm. it's like three minutes, even though mm -hmm. it's not a super. Although it's actually fairly high tempo. It's not. It's not really a slow song. It's a gentle song, but it's not slow. Mm. Do you know what the tempo is offhand? No, I, I don't actually know what the tempo is offhand, but it's definitely not slow. Like the BPMs yeah. are, you know, one fifteen or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's got it's, it's got it's, some it's got a groove actually. You know, it's yeah. it does have a it does have some movement to it, and and it does it does sort of chug along. Um, yeah, and it's a really interesting. There's interesting structure. Like there's no bridge. It's just it's very very symmetrical. It's verse, chorus, verse, chorus. It's an A B A B. Which, totally. Which a lot of the other songs. I mean. Some of them are, you know, not fully like that, but a lot of the structures of the other songs has that A-B, A-B feel. Um, but there's space in it for the guys to kind of bring in their their own feel. And what's mm -hmm. interesting about Lay Me Down is, it, you know, I don't know if you can hear it so much in the drum and percussive elements of the song, but Chris, the drummer, has a background in Latin percussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, I can hear that. You can hear it in, and you can really hear it in Lay Me Down, and he is a Latin percussionist, so this playing our genre is the first time he's ever played 
kind of in an Americana mm. folk kind of vibe. Um, and then our electric guitarist is like just a classic rock, you know, the, the black crows kind of loves mm-hmm. rich Rob rich and Chris Robinson. And so he's like really rooted in, in kind of that old school rock and roll. And then the bassist is kind of Jack of all trades. And I'm just like, you know, kind of basic singer songwriter. So you have these, like all these, these four very different, uh, you know, musical experiences coming together in a group, which I think, which for us is really fun because it makes the songs just not, you know, they don't really fit one genre. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which is always a great thing to bring, to bring different influences and stuff um, together into the, into the same band. It's, it's a great, it's a great feeling for sure. Yeah. It's a, it's a great little tune. And it just shows you, you don't have to, it's so easy as a songwriter, I think to overwrite. Yeah. And, you know, they go, oh, I need to have three verses and a bridge and, and a pre-chorus and all that stuff. And you don't necessarily have to. And, you know, it's not like I thought this song, oh, was lacking anything. You know, it yeah, had enough no, breaks didn't, to didn't it. I didn't feel like it was lacking, no. Yeah, so. Uh, it's, it's very soft. It's very gentle. And it's not like it's... It's not like it's repetitive. I mean, it you know the the chorus repeats, but you know the verses have got a lot of content in them, so to speak. Yeah. So it doesn't feel empty, you know. Yeah. We we do o- overcomplicate things as songwriters, though. You know, it's easy to oh yeah to oh, you yeah. know you say hey I need I need it to be more complex or more complicated, and you look at you know some of our favorite songs ever written, and so many of them are just those three chord, three four chord songs that you know that are timeless. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's 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 the opposite of complicating. It's like simplify. How do we simplify the songwriting process so that, you know, one we make it easier on ourselves as songwriters, but also like it's relatable to the to the kind of average listener who doesn't yeah. maybe have that technical ear. Yeah, for sure. And simplify does not mean rob it of any richness. It can still be simple yeah. and rich. <laughs> simple yeah. and rich. So, uh, what, what's what's coming up next uh, for you guys in Calico? Yeah, so we're releasing our third album, Northern Girl. We're going to release uh, at the end of the summer. Um, and hopefully tour locally. We're still we're still waiting on securing some gigs. Um, but, you know, I've kind of applied to the festival circuit um, cool. in Western Canada. Awesome. So hoping to kind of break into that scene. And we don't have any representation, you know, at the moment. So it's, you know, we're just good old independent artists trying to figure it out. So yeah, that's what we do. Bit. Awesome so, stuff. Yeah, well, okay. And I believe that is all the time we have on Song Talk Radio tonight. Um, so special thanks to Tony and uh, Calico. And uh, where can our listeners hear more of your music, Tony? Uh, you can find us on Spotify at Calico, which is in all caps, and then our Instagram handle, which is calico.news. Cool beans. And uh, we want to hear from you, our dear listeners. Please send us your comments on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram to at Song Talk Radio, or send us an email, feedback at songtalk.ca. Also, be sure to check out our YouTube channel for live performance videos and full episodes, and subscribe today to the Song Talk Radio podcast on your favorite podcast provider. And you can find links to all the products, books, and web services we mentioned on Song Talk Radio on our resources page on the website. And please join us uh, for our next monthly Song Talk meetup. Whether you're in Toronto for our in-person meetups or anywhere in the world for our online meetups, it's free to join on meetup.com and free to attend. Bring a song and a lyric sheet and get constructive feedback from other songwriters. Stop by songtalk.ca for the link. You can follow me at neomodi.com. You can follow Phil at philemory.ca. And uh, Tony, what's, uh, what's Calico's favorite social media platform? Uh, Instagram is uh, where we're at, calico.music, and we also have a website, calicomusic.ca. Awesome stuff, and we will link to all that stuff on our uh, show post on songtalk.ca. And uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Be sure to stop by the website, songtalk.ca, to browse past shows and find out how you can be a guest. Thanks for tuning in, and keep on writing. writing. Good night. (laughs) Thanks for having me, guys.